Coming up, we kick off the Food as Medicine Summit with a keynote from Dr. Dariush Muzaffarian, cardiologist, professor, and director of the Food as Medicine Institute at the Friedman School of Nutrition, Science, and Policy at Tufts University. I'm really uh, pleased to be here with you virtually. Uh, I uh, regret I couldn't be there in person. I have a great fondness for uh, New York, having gone to Columbia for medical school and lived in New York for, for several years. Uh, and so it's really exciting to be talking about food as medicine at the Hunter College Food as Medicine Summit. Uh, this is a really important area that's, that's rapidly accelerating uh, in interest from payers, from policymakers, from doctors, from patients. Uh, and so I want to just speak with you about, you know, my impressions about what's going on, what's the current innovation, and what are the future directions in food as medicine. You know, the first thing to really think about is is just to recognize how sick we are as a nation from diet-related diseases, why food as medicine is so important. Today, more uh, American adults are sick than are healthy, many, many more. Half of all adults in our country have diabetes or prediabetes. Think about that. Think about that. Half of every single adult in our country has diabetes or prediabetes. Three in four have overweight or obesity. And if you combine that with blood cholesterol levels and blood pressure, 14 out of 15 adults in the United States have suboptimal cardiometabolic health, 14 out of 15. So it's truly the, the rare person who's, who's walking around healthy. And I think this is really um, making us all feel sick and walk around feeling sick. And most Americans maybe don't even realize that how sick that they feel uh, and, and uh, how this is hurting their mental health and physical health. And this starts young. Among American teenagers, one in four American teenagers has prediabetes. One in four. One in four have overweight or obesity. And one in six have non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Now, there are also, of course, stark disparities uh, in all of these uh, uh, statistics. Um, so folks who are rural, lower income, lower education from black or Latinx or, or indigenous backgrounds all have even higher rates of, of these conditions. It's really incredible. And if you put all this together, uh, you know, most much of this is due to poor nutrition. Uh, we have we and others have carefully quantified the burdens of cardiometabolic diseases specifically attributable to poor nutrition. And we've estimated that 10,000 Americans are dying every week directly from poor nutrition, 10,000 Americans a week. And there are 21,000 new cases of diabetes every week directly attributable to diabetes. In sum, almost half of all cardiometabolic disease events and almost 70% of all new cases of diabetes are attributable to, to poor diet. Now, this is where food as medicine is really important. And there are different ways to talk about food as, as medicine and different definitions. I think of food as medicine as integrating uh, food-based nutritional interventions into the healthcare system to treat disease and advance health equity. So all four of those kind of elements of the definition are important. It's about food-based nutritional interventions, not supplements or just, just dietary counseling, but, but food-based interventions. It's integrated into healthcare for, for the first time, really, in, in my career. You know, we actually are having these interventions integrated into healthcare. It's to treat disease, not just to think about long term prevention 20 years or 30 years from now, but to actually treat disease. And, and it has to also advance health equity. And we'll, we'll talk about e each of those, those issues. And so the first question is, you know, what, um, you know, why do we care so much about, about integrating food into health? I've, I've told you about the incredible uh, challenges in, in disease and disability and, and health, health disparities from poor nutrition. But we, we have to sort of turn to what the newest science is telling us about where are these burdens coming from. Uh, starting around 1980, we were really taking a serious uh, look at diet-related diseases in this country. And the major recommendations to address those were to reduce the bad things, less fat, 
less saturated fat, less dietary cholesterol, less salt, and so on. And while, of course, excess salt is harmful uh, and excess added sugars in, in beverages are harmful, um, we've learned since that, that while there are, of course, negative things in foods that we have to reduce, most of the disease burden in, in our country and actually around the world is not due to excess intake of harmful uh, factors. It's due to insufficient intake of protective factors. So we really need to increase the good. What's missing uh, is causing more disease than, than what we're eating too much of. And so these include foods like uh, minimally processed fruits and nuts and uh, fish and other seafood, vegetables, plant oils, minimally processed whole grains, beans and legumes, yogurt. All of these foods are, are being eaten uh, you know, at too low levels. This is a very important positive message about food. It's a positive message for patients. It's a positive message for, for farmers. It's a positive message for retailers and food manufacturers. We don't just need to demonize and think about food as something negative. We need to celebrate uh, its nourishing aspects. And this is what food as medicine does. Food as medicine really uh, looks at these protective foods, fruits, nuts, vegetables, beans and legumes, plant oils, fish, yogurt, whole grains, and, and gives them to patients uh, in need. And so I think that's really a, a critical positive message about, about food as medicine. Now, uh, I think of food as medicine uh, as a pyramid, and we've published this, this pyramid, where at the top of the pyramid, uh, you have uh, the sickest patients who need the most intensive interventions. And at the bottom of the pyramid, you have the broad population who need broad population-based food as medicine interventions. And so what are these different uh, uh, levels of interventions? At the top, we have medically tailored meals. And medically tailored meals are for, for patients who have multiple comorbidities, complex illness, things like uh, uh, very poorly controlled diabetes, end-stage renal disease, heart failure, uh, other cardiovascular disease, cancer, uh, HIV, uh, severe lung disease, and so on. These patients uh, arrive to hospitals and doctor's offices and emergency rooms malnourished. They depart malnourished. They have a very high risk of rehospitalization. They have a very high risk of not being able to return to their home and have to be admitted to a skilled nursing facility or other institutional care. And so medically tailored meals are really sort of the tip of the spear uh, for, for patients. And we'll talk about those. Uh, in, I'll talk more about those in a minute. Then below the next level of the pyramid are medically tailored groceries and produce prescription programs where people have diet related diseases, but aren't so sick and malnourished uh, that they're unable to, to shop and cook. They can shop, they can cook, and, and they, they really need healthy foods, but they they can get them in the form of groceries and produce prescriptions. The next layer of the pyramid, which, which is really important also to integrate into healthcare, uh, is to leverage the federal nutrition programs. SNAP, formerly the food stamps program, WIC, which is for pregnant uh, and nursing women and young children, uh, and school meals for, for school-aged kids. Those federal nutrition programs can all be very important to improve food security and also, uh, if, if done right, improve nutrition and improve nutrition security. And then lastly, at the bottom of the pyramid, the bottom of the pyramid are population level, healthy food policies and programs, things that support everything else, things that support the medically tailored meals and groceries and produce prescriptions uh, that support the federal nutrition programs. All of this uh, has to be uh, uh, integrated with nutrition counseling uh, and culinary education, not just nutrition education, but culinary education. Now the depth and intensity of that education remains unclear most patients who are offered, you know, one-on-one -on -one RDM counseling don't, don't use it. And we've seen that in a recent randomized trial. Only about 20% of, of patients used an RDN and only half of them used it more, more than once, half of that 22%. So, so most people, you know, don't want, have that need to see a one-on-one -on -one RDN. For those that do, it's, it's excellent and an RDN can be very powerful. But we need to, I think, have more digital uh, and scalable interventions to reach people where they are uh, more quickly, more rapidly, more efficiently. So that's sort of the scope and scale of food as medicine from the top of the pyramid uh, to the bottom. Now, medically tailored meals, I think, are, are really exciting because um, they not only uh, improve food security and nutrition and health, they actually reduce healthcare spending. Uh, we've done an analysis suggesting that if the roughly 6 million Americans in our country who might be eligible for medically tailored meals all receive them. If they all receive medically tailored meals, about 10 nutritionally tailored meals per week for an average of eight months per year, 
Um, even accounting for the program costs, these, these, uh, this intervention would save money because hospitalizations are reduced uh, and emergency uh, visits are reduced. And so total healthcare costs are reduced by about 20%, even accounting for the cost of the program. We estimated a national program of medically tailored meals uh, that was covered as a covered benefit for patients with complex conditions would uh, reduce uh, annual hospitalizations in, in the United States by 1.6 million hospitalizations and it would reduce net healthcare spending in our country by $14 billion. And so this is really kind of a no-brainer to implement medically tailored meals. And there's a, a bipartisan bill that's been introduced in the Senate uh, and similar language in the House um, to implement, to test and implement and pilot medically tailored meals in Medicare, which I think is really important given you know, most Americans uh, are, are covered by Medicare. Now I mentioned produce prescriptions, and so that's the you know a, a, the next level down in the, in the pyramid. And we recently published a paper on about 4,000 uh, people across 22 sites in 12 states. Uh, now these were not uh, randomized interventions, but what we found is that after six months of intervention, produce prescriptions improved fruit and vegetable intake by about a serving per day, improved self-reported health by 60%, reduced food insecurity by 36% improved hemoglobin A1C, improved blood pressure, uh, and improved body mass index. And so really powerful evidence that, that these programs work. And just this week uh, at the American Heart Association meeting, uh, my uh, collaborator, uh, Claudia Nau uh, from Kaiser Permanente presented the results of the first large randomized control trial of produce prescriptions, which we implemented and completed uh, in Southern California, along with FoodSmart and the George Institute. And we showed in a randomized control trial among low-income Americans uh, with, with uh, diabetes that produce prescriptions significantly lower hemoglobin A1C. And so we have the evidence now to begin to implement uh, these interventions. And now, while I, d I think there are, you know, is incredible power in these interventions to advance nutrition security uh, and advance uh, health equity, I think there are also questions. And this is where the field is going. So we talked about the innovation, the excitement, but there's a lot of questions. What are the optimal foods that should be covered? Is it just fruits and vegetables? Uh, should, should protein foods be covered? What about uh, uh, nuts and beans and legumes? My own belief is that we need to cover the foods that I mentioned before that are, that are clearly shown to be healthy. There's also questions about the dose. It's not, not really clear that more is better. Uh, most programs uh, might give $40 a month or $50 a month of produce prescriptions, and it's not really clear that, that doubling that uh, has a significant additional benefit. So, so we really have to understand the dose. We also have to understand the duration. Many of these programs only go for six months. And I think that it's very likely that, that many patients will need prolonged treatment, just like we give prolonged treatment for blood pressure lowering or for cholesterol lowering. With food as medicine programs, we also may need to give prolonged treatment. Other patients may just need a few months or six months of treatment and then, and then are better and don't need more treatment. So I think that's very, very important. We have to better understand the role of nutrition and culinary education and how to deliver that efficiently to reach patients. And, and I'm guessing this is gonna be, um, you know, a range of different options for different patients who, who respond, uh, some digitally, some in person, uh, some in group education and, and other ways. We have to understand the importance of family sharing of the programs. If you give $50 a month in, in healthy produce to a single uh, person versus a family of five, it's likely the food will be shared in the family of five. And so how do we account for that and how do, how do we consider that? I think there's really interesting questions about how to get the food to people. Um, should they pick it up uh, in, in a physical brick and mortar uh, uh, a grocery store in the healthcare setting? That's being done. Uh, should they get a card and go, go buy it themselves in the grocery store? That's also being done. Or should they get online delivery? Um, and, and personally, I think that the the, the intervention that will reach the most people will be online delivery because that also deals with issues of time and transportation and food access. Uh, there's many, many other questions about, you know, doctor's education, how we educate doctors about these things, cost, cost and cost effectiveness, uh, how these programs link to uh, other new drug treatments like the GLP-1 agonists that, that are, are effective for weight loss and, and much more. So I think it's a really exciting time for food as medicine. There's enormous attention from policymakers uh, in, in the federal government, from policymakers in states, from private healthcare payers uh, like Elevance and uh, Kaiser uh, and, 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 and Geisinger Health and many others. Um, nine states now have active food as medicine programs in Medicaid, either 
approved or about to be approved uh, as pilot programs. Uh, New York, New York is about to have one of the largest ones approved. If, if you're not familiar with that, which is really exciting. And so, you know, the genie is out of the bottle. The genie of of uh, having nourishing food be a tool, a tool uh, uh, in, in the toolbox of doctors and other allied health professionals is now a reality. And so I think it's an exciting time, a lot of work to do. And we're really excited at the Food is Medicine Institute at Tufts uh, to be uh, uh, working on solutions, working on solutions with researchers, with po uh, policymakers, with the healthcare system, uh, with community-based organizations, and, and with people in, in the community who, who care about these issues. So um, thank you for letting me come and speak to you a little bit about Food is Medicine. Uh, and, and I think the exciting times uh, ahead and look forward to working together to make this a reality for more Americans.